So we are studying a duality, which is holographic, between quantum gravity in the cylindrical box and a quantum field theory, which is a conformal field theory known as n equals 4 super young mills in the boundary of that cylinder, which is just time times the three sphere. <clears throat> we can insert operators, we can consider operators in this boundary theory. Remember when we were drawing the cylinder, we were putting some operators at the origin. And you see that considering them at, the at minus infinity here in the, peri in the past, in the cylinder, or in the bulk, what the dictionary tells you is that when you prepare some state at minus infinity in the boundary, you are also preparing it in the bulk. You see? So you have some state, some operator with some spin s and dimension delta that you insert at minus infinity. It's the same as studying a string, not on the boundary, but inside with spin s and energy delta. Right? This was what we concluded. I just want to stress this slightly different point of view that you can think that you have this cylinder, you are putting the state at minus infinity at the very bottom, and by putting the state at the very infinity at the many, very bottom, you create a state in the CFT and you create a string in the ball. And the two guys are dual to each other. So tomorrow, we will study strings with spin S because we are considering operators with spin, so we will study strings with spin, which are spinning inside the, the, the box, and with some energy delta, but today we continue with the CFT. Yeah, and this was the form of the operators that we saw yesterday and in the homework. Let me add a brief comment that I don't think I stressed, which is that ADS has isometries. I mean, this space, ADS 5 times S5, is really very symmetrical. You have a sphere, for example. So you have SO6 rotations that preserve the 5 sphere. Right? So you have all these isometries that preserve the sphere, this SO6 rotation. And ADS, which is a pseudosphere, an hyperboloid, has the Lorentz group that leaves the hyperboloid invariant, which is SO2,4, which is isomorphic to the conformal group. So how do these symmetries map to symmetries of n equals 4 super young mills? Well, one is obvious, and that one we did stress. The isometries of ADS are mapped here to symmetries of n equals 4, whereas SO4,2 is the conformal group. What about rotations in this SO6? Where is this SO6 inside n equals 4? Well, SO6 should be related to the degrees of freedom orthogonal to the brain. And remember yesterday when we were doing this dimensional reduction, we start with 10 dimensional fields and then we had the gauge fields on the brain and we had the scalars that before corresponded to the gauge field directions orthogonal to the brain. And we have six scalars. And there is a rotation symmetry that rotates the scalars among themselves. And this is exactly this SO6 symmetry. So this SO6 symmetry is what is called an R symmetry. And which is related, for example, to the rotation of the six scalars in n equals 4 among themselves. is a V. Okay? So that you have, a, you have some symmetry, you have, some, you have six scalars, the action is invariant on the rotations of the scalars, you, there's nothing special about phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, phi 5, phi 5, 6, they're all equivalent, you can rotate between them. And this rotation symmetry is exactly a manifestation of the fact that you have a rotation symmetry in the dual theory. Okay, very good. So how did we start computing then these two sides of the dictionary? We started by computing dimensions in the gauge theory. And we did it by studying four-point function, a very simple operators, operators that external operators were very simple. But then by summing and by reading what is flowing, we could read the dimensions of what is flowing. We did it at three level and one loop, and therefore we concluded that the dimension up to one loop was given by this expression, which was some classical dimension and then some anomalous part. And this anomalous part was given by these harmonic numbers. Okay? And this is the result at weak coupling, so we can start drawing the beginning part of the plot. Now, you see that it's easy now, if you want, to plot this plot. All you did was plot, there is a constant value and some slope, but if you want to start seeing this curvature here, like I drew in this plot, you need to compute the lambda square term, the lambda cube, and so on. <coughs> right? We want to start seeing some more detail about the plot. Is it clear? 
how would you do it? For example, the, in the approach that we computed yesterday, you would ask someone to give you the four point function at two loops, three loops, and so on. Repeat the same analysis and start reading off the dimensions of these operators and studying how this curve is bending. Is it clear? Okay, let me just tell you that this is known indeed. So this guy that we studied at one loop, it was computed around 98. This guy was computed around the year 2000. And this guy at three loops was computed roughly 20 days ago, so last month. So, and I can give you the reference to this paper and there you can find the reference to the other ones. So this one was computed 23rd of the previous month, so 27th, roughly 20 days ago. So you can check it out, but it's already quite a monstrous expression. It's kind of scary, but you could explain, expand it and read off the dimension. What about higher loops? What is known about higher loops from this approach? From this approach, there exists an algorithm for computing the integrand. What is the integrand? The integrand is what you compute when you draw all Feynman diagrams that contribute to a given graph and put all the Feynman diagrams together. So it's already a lot of work, right, to just compute the Feynman diagrams, but then you have to do the Feynman diagrams. Right? So the integrand is what you compute when you write all the propagators and so on, write all the graphs, put everything together and say, okay, now we need to compute this. Now you could say, okay, but the integrand is trivial. Come on, it's just draw Feynman diagrams. The hard part is to compute the diagrams. But well, actually that's very misleading because it is more or less true what you are saying or what you would say at one loop maybe, or even at one loop. But at higher loops, actually this is not done by computing Feynman diagrams. It's done using very fancy uh, graph, graph theoretical techniques that people are developing last year and so on, Korshemsky and collaborators. So if you want to learn more about it, I can tell you. It's a very beautiful story of graph theory, how to compute exactly this integrand, but then it is still a big challenge to compute. Okay? So this is more or less the state of the art where people are right now concerning the computation of these correlation functions. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Just a very stupid question. So if you have a perturbation theory, you should be perturbing in small p young mil. That's right. Uh, but you are perturbing in small lambda. Yes, we are always considering we are always considering the planar limit, where we take g and mills to zero, n to infinity, and lambda fixed. But then you can always make n much larger and go to the strong coupling lambda, right? Now I replace n by n squared, and suddenly I'm at large lambda. Or okay, so we are always in the planar limit where n goes to infinity, right? Lambda, which is g and mills square n is fixed, but it's much smaller than 1 in perturbation theory. Otherwise, you cannot use perturbation theory. Right? So what you do is you draw, you can do, of course, perturbation theory in G young mills, but then you throw away the graphs that are non-planar. In other words, if you just draw graphs that are planar, you never see G young mills, all you see is lambda. And if you draw a graph at one loop, a one loop graph like this, This graph doesn't give you G young mills, it will give you something like lambda. And then a graph with two loops will give you lambda square, lambda cube, and so on. So, um, if you are doing one loop, you can only keep the terms linear in lambda. You only have terms linear in lambda by constraint. Okay? But when we keep only planar graphs, we do perturbation theory in lambda, not in G young mills. Is it clear? So if you draw planar graphs, by construction, they are always of the form n square, which is just overall factor, times g and times lambda, the tooth coupling, to the power of how many loops you have. So if you have one loop, your graph will be always n square times lambda. If you have two loops, no matter what graph it is, it's always n square times lambda square. And three loops, it's n square times lambda cube, and so on. So it's an expansion in lambda that we do in perturbation theory. Okay? So again, let me emphasize, why are we considering the planar limit? We are studying this limit where strings are nearly free. So they don't split into two. And to compute the energy of a single trace operator is dual to computing the energy of a single string. 
Okay, <clears throat> now just one comment, which is that at large S, the twist, which is the dimension minus the spin of an operator, in any gauge theory, diverges logarithmically with the spin of the operator. Okay. This is a well-known statement in gauge theories. It's not, it's, it's true in any gauge theory that large spin of, the, the large spin behavior of uh, the anomalous dimension of an operator grows logarithmically with a spin. Okay? So it should be given by a function of lambda, the twist, times logarithm of the spin. Well, I mean, let's suppose we did not know this general statement, this, which is a statement that you can find. Let's just see that if this is true here. So indeed, lambda over 2 pi square times these harmonic numbers of spin. These harmonic numbers are just sum of 2k up to s of 1 over k. So you see it diverges logarithmically. When s is large, you can replace the sum by an integral. And it indeed is exactly equal to lambda over 2 pi square log s for large spin. So indeed, this relation, we check this relation at weak coupling, and we compute f of lambda, and f of lambda starts at lambda over 2 pi square. And now, if you, if you were to repeat this exercise using this expression that is still manageable, very easy to work with, and this one, which is a big pain, you would conclude that the same thing is true. Indeed, as we expect, the dimensions grow logarithmically. And you can compute this function f, and here is what you get. Minus lambda square over 96 pi square plus 11 lambda cubed. So, pi square minus lambda 4 here is the result up to four loops for what this function which is called the cusp anomalous dimension. Okay. Now, this is a very nice function for several reasons. So this function has a huge amount of physics. It's a pity we don't have much time to explore the physics of this function. So let me first point out why it is interesting from a very pragmatic point of view. From a very pragmatic point of view, this is a nice observable to study because it's a function of a single variable. It's just a function of lambda. So it's a very nice function to plot. There's no spin, there's nothing. It's just a function of lambda. We can plot it and see how ADS-CFT works and how we go from weak to strong coupling with just a function that depends on lambda and nothing else. So this is a good example of what is called an interpolating function. It's a function that interpolates it is just some function of lambda that is a very good function to check ADS-CFT. It starts in some way and it goes some other way. And this is weak coupling. And this is strong. And this is all the function depends on. This lambda. And it interpolates all the way between weak and strong coupling. So it's a good, a very good, a very pure function to check this duality without any dependence on spin without any dependence on any extra parameter. So we isolated just a single function as whatever multiplies log s when spin goes to infinity. There are other reasons why it is very interesting. I can, tell, for example, it governs the infrared behavior of scattering, of gluon scattering amplitude. Okay. It's not obvious why. It's a true, but it's a true statement, but you have to believe me at this point. It governs the ultraviolet behavior of Wilson loops with cusps. That are will okay, but probably you also never saw Wilson loops, so this tells you even less. But Wilson loops are the govern the behavior of heavy particles along some path, and if the particle makes some sharp corner, this quantity also behaves the behavior of that particle due to the effect of that huge acceleration. <clears throat> and finally, maybe a bit easier to understand, 
This function is related to a very fundamental object in gauge theory, which is the flux tube. So the flux tube, when you have a quark and an antiquark, can separate, and there is some flux tube of energy between the quark and an antiquark. And this quantity is measuring exactly the energy density of the flux tube in this gauge theory, which is n equals 4 super young mil. So how do we see that this F is somehow related to separating two, like a quark and an antiquark? Why is it related to separating and stretching and creating a flux tube? That is simple to understand. That's just because when you take S to be very large, you have these two fields Z, and you have many derivatives in between. But putting many derivatives in between two fields is exactly like creating effectively some separation. It's delocalizing the operator. You see? Is it clear? So when you put an operator, a derivative, an operator is like a single, like a small separation, like Z, Z plus F. When you put more and more and more derivatives, you are effectively delocalizing the operator. So this, in practice, taking spin to infinity, if the spin is very large, well, this operator that we typically think as a local operator, probably it is more reasonable to think of it as some stretched operator, and this is how the flux tube appears. So this is an interesting object. It has a huge amount of physics. It's related to the energy density of the flux tube in n equals 4. And this is an object that you'll study for a bit more in today's tutorial, and we also study it a bit more tomorrow. Okay? Very good. So this concludes the summary. And now we go to point two that we had yesterday, which was let's try to compute these dimensions of operators in a gauge theory by a direct computation. So let's try to look at this operator and compute this delta directly and not by looking at a four-point function. Okay. So now we do direct computation. Okay, <clears throat> so first, there is an important claim, which is that in a CFT, in a conformal field theory, there exists a direct relation between the dimensions of operators and the renormalization of those operators. A multiplicative renormalization of those operators. Is this a familiar statement? Did you study any critical phenomena in these lectures up to now? No? Yes? Some people are laughing. I don't know if this means yes or not. Okay. Uh, maybe it is worth reviewing a little bit, but tell me if, if I'm going too slowly. So take a CFT, for example, CFT with a single operator or one operator that is relevant for this discussion, O, and consider the correlation function of O of x and O of y. So what will happen? Well, you will compute it, and let's compute it in perturbation theory at one loop. We get something like the distance between the two fields to the power two classical dimension, the dimension that appears in the Lagrangian. You see, if the operator is z squared or zx is two, for example. And then we do perturbation theory. So we have 1 plus lambda, okay? or let me parameterize it in the following way, minus lambda, some number that I call gamma 1. And then what often will happen is that you will get a logarithmic divergence with a cutoff. Okay? When you are doing perturbation theory and you have to renormalize. Well, of course, the cutoff has dimensions. A log can only have dimensionless arguments. So what must appear close to the cutoff is the only dimension full parameter, which is the distance between the two points by dimensional analysis. So this is what you should typically expect when doing perturbation theory. You do perturbation theory, you get this log divergence. Now, how do you interpret this? Okay? How do you interpret this? Well, it's very simple. This means, therefore, means that the correlation function between the renormalized operators is 
Let me write what the result is, and then what is the definition of orinormalized. X minus Y to the power 2 delta classical plus lambda gamma 1, where the renormalized operator is defined as lambda So let's see if we understand what's going on. So all I did here was, okay, first we realized that in perturbation theory, this is nothing but lambda square x minus y square to the power, uh, to the power minus lambda gamma 1 plus tac, tac, tac. And then I put the lambda on the left-hand side and keep the x minus y on the right-hand side. Is it clear? So this tells me that this operator has, is the renormalized operator. It has finite correlation functions. It has finite correlation functions. If this guy had some dimension delta classical, I'm multiplying it by something dimension full to some power. So the dimension of this full thing now has dimension delta classical plus an anomalous part. And indeed, this is exactly what we see here. The dimension that appears in this renormalized operator is delta classical plus an anomalous part. Okay? It's exactly as it should be. So we see that there is a direct relation between the anomalous or the quantum, the anomalous dimensions of operators and the renormalization of the operator. So if you know how to renormalize them, you know what is their dimension. Let's be even more explicit. And let's summarize. So one, what do we do to compute the dimension? We compute uh, we compute a two point function. We look at the log lambda divergence, or rather, that is, at whatever multiplies log lambda, okay? And that's something that is the anomalous dimension. But it's very simple to compute. You compute two-point function, you look at the logarithmic divergence, the coefficient of the logarithmic divergence gives you the quantum correction to the dimension of the operator. Okay? So far, so good. Now, n equals 4 does not have one operator. There's many operators. So let's generalize a bit this discussion if now we have several operators with the same classical dimension. Okay? For example, trace of z, 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 trace of zzx, trace of zyx, all these guys have dimension 3 to classical order. Right? So there are many operators in n equals 4 that all have dimension 3. Just trace of a product of three fields. Right? We have tons of fields to put. So now let's generalize a bit. So if we have several OA. So now we do with several operators. Yesterday I was told I was writing too small. Am I still writing too small? Okay, can you see? Is it okay? If not, please come. Okay, so with several operators, we have OA, OB. How does it generalize? Well, we get 1 over x minus y to the power of 2 delta classical. Of course, they must have the same delta classical. Otherwise, immediately you would get 0. And then, okay, to leading order, you just we contract the two operators. But to sub-leading order, the divergence now depends on both operators. It's a matrix. Let's put also minus, lambda. This one indicates one loop, as before. And then this multiplies log of lambda square x minus y square. 
Okay? So now we have a matrix. So how do we convert, how do we transform a matrix into a number? I mean, how do we reduce from this more complicated setup to the previous one that was so simple? Any proposal? Space. Sorry? Space. Uh, well, trace, you would contract these two indices. And, uh, okay, indeed, here you would get one number. But that would not tell you how, to, that would maybe tell you how to renormalize the operator such that this particular two-point function would be zero, would be finite. But then you take another one with A and C, and there's no reason why it would be finite. So you want to renormalize the operators in a way that once the operator is renormalized, I use it in any correlation function, I always get finite results. Okay? So what you are saying would maybe re work, would renormalize only the trace of this correlation function. Uh, not good enough. But there are something simple. So first of all, note that we can think of this guy as some matrix element between operator OA, some matrix O, and some operator OB. Okay, this is just a statement that given two operators, I compute some divergence. It's the definition of an operator, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can think of it in this way. So now, what we do is the following. We consider we have this matrix, and we diagonalize it. So we consider some operator, O A diag, such that gamma O diag is equal to gamma, a number, times O diag. Okay. So you have some matrix, right? So for example, in N equals 4, you write the fields with dimension 3, and you get some matrix, which is what's called the mixing matrix, because it mixes everyone. And you diagonalize it, and you find the eigenvectors, which are the, some linear combination of operators, right? So this OA diagonal is some linear combination of your operators. Okay. You diagonalize, you find this linear combination such that it diagonalizes this matrix. Well, once it is diagonalized, this formula becomes exactly the same as before. Then it's very simple. All you do is you put OA diag, OB diag. Now both terms will be proportional to delta AB that I can take out over x minus y to the power 2 delta classical, and then 1 minus lambda gamma 1a of operator a times the log. Therefore, we first diagonalize this matrix and then define the operator we normalized which is nothing but lambda to the minus, or to the plus, to the plus, lambda gamma 1a times the operator diagonal a. So there is one more step before multiplying by lambda. We, we consider the operators that diagonalize. And these operators, they have nice correlation function. Then, the correlation function between this renormalized operator and the other renormalized operator is just this. We said in the very beginning of our lecture that we could always find some base. Here is how you do it in practice, where the operators are just orthogonal and the exponent is nothing but delta classical plus lambda gamma 1 plus tac tac tac. So the conclusion, so what's the algorithm? We compute two-point function, OA, OB. We read gamma AB that multiplies the log divergence. Okay, for each operator, this defines a matrix. We diagonalize the matrix. 
And once you diagonalized it, you use your result. The eigenvectors give you the good operators, the operators that have definite anomalous dimension. These are operators with definite anomalous dimension, well defined. And the eigenvalues of this matrix, they give you the anomalous dimension. OK? Any question? No? Is it clear? OK. Let's have a look at how could this, uh, how, so what is this matrix gamma? So what do we know about this matrix gamma that apparently we need to diagonalize? OK. <clears throat> well. Let's see. So we have to do a two-point function between operators in our large n theory. What we are going to discuss now, it's true in n equals 4, it's true in any theory with a large n limit. Okay? So let's, li let's just be very general and say, how would the computation be of a two-point function in the large n limit? So you have a trace operator okay, that I can represent like this. By this, I mean the following. This is operator 1, 2, 3, 4, L. And by this, I mean trace of a product of fields chi 1, chi 2, chi L. Okay? So chi i can be one of the scalars, can be a z, can be an x, can be a y, can be a complex scalar, but can be also derivative of a complex scalar. Uh, can be a field strength, can be a fermion or even derivative of a fermion. Okay. It's any letter. And this is what's called a word. Okay. It can be whatever you want. Something in any build out of the build covariant, in, uh, gauge invariant building blocks in n equals 4. Anything that transforms under gauge transformation is u field u minus 1. Okay? Now, and then we consider, so this is our operator OA. And then we consider down here, so again, is this notation clear? Why am I using this double line notation like this? I mean, is it clear? Don't be misled. All, the, all these points are at the same space-time point X. I'm just using it as a line to indicate the SUN indices. They are all at the same point, okay? So I could draw it as a star. I'm just drawing it as a line to indicate it's like a one-dimensional structure, this trace. One, two, three, up to L. Is it okay? Is this notation clear? Well, now we do the same for the other operator, OB. Okay, and OB is again and now we contract the fields. We, co we, co we, do the we compute the two-point function, so we compute by propagator. And now you see, because we are computing it in a planar limit, this line here, if I connect this guy with this guy, this line cannot decide to go connect to someone very far away because otherwise lines would cross. So because of planarity, because I'm obliged to be able to draw my graph on the plane, I cannot start connecting graphs very far away and crossing all the lines. So at, all, at one loop, all I can do is two neighboring lines can interact somehow. Let me denote this interaction by some shaded region, and let's give a few examples of what this interaction could be. But all it could do is some local interaction, and then nothing else. Okay? So this is all it can do. All this two-point function can do. In other words, gamma AB 
is almost delta AB up to a sum of local interactions at neighboring operators. That is, the trace here and the trace here, to have a non-zero two-point function, they must be either the same or differ just by some permutation of fields or something very simple. Okay? They cannot be very crazy different operators, otherwise the two-point function will be immediately zero. So this blob here, by this blob, what do we mean? We mean, for example, some exchange of a gluon, or, for example, if it's scalar, some scalar interaction. Remember that it was a four vertex plus tac, tac, tac. Okay. So something like this. Okay. So then, immediately, even without noticing any details, we know that there is a nice point of view that we can adopt. That is just a question of notation, but it's kind of a nice notation. So we can use some, some nice analogy which is the following. You can say that this trace of chi 1 up to chi L, okay, I can think of it, it is just notation, as a cat in a spin chain, chi 1 up to chi L. And this is a spin, a closed spin chain. And it's closed because of the trace. So it's a spin chain that I should identify because the trace is cyclic. It's cyclic, right? So this is just a question of notation. I think my space of traces defines some linear space. I can think in a sense, just I replace the notation by cat. Just a question of notation, right? Replace trace by cat, I mean, nothing else. But in this language, the operator gamma, right? The, the matrix gamma that maps some operator OA into some operator OB, right? that has non-zero elements between operator OA and OB, is nothing, you can think of it as some sum from n equal 1 up to L of some Hamiltonian density that acts on these spin chains on sites n and n plus 1. It acts at most on the letters at position n and n plus 1, giving some two other letters. Okay? So we see that in large n theories, this is general for any conformal field theory, but in large n theories, all we have to compute is the, at one loop, of course, is the Hamiltonian density between sides n and n plus 1. This is at one loop. So all you have to do is compute this Hamiltonian density, and we just reduced a four-dimensional problem into a problem of a one-dimensional quantum spin chain. Then we can ask our condensed matter friends, here is a spin chain, what's the spectrum of this spin chain? And the spectrum of the spin chain is the spectrum of dimensions of our four-dimensional gauge theory. So it's as simple as that. You just compute the Hamiltonian of your spin chain, of this emerging spin chain, and then diagonalize it. Put it in a computer, do whatever you want, diagonalize it exactly, and you get a spectrum of dimensions of operators in a gauge theory. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to tell you what the result is for this H. So actually, it's a very nice computation. I hesitated whether I should just compute it explicitly at one loop. But, uh, but given what I want to do later, I will just tell you the result. I think it's conceptually clear. You would compute two-point functions, see where the log divergences, and so on. So do you mind if I just skip the, the result? And let me tell you, if you want to see the computation, last year I did it, so you can check last year. Okay? Very good. So what is the result? Now it depends on what kind of operators we are interested in. We have a huge choice of operators. And there are sectors that are closed in the sense that Hamiltonian is block diagonal and doesn't mix everyone with everyone. 
For example, it's natural that if you have an operator with one fermion, it will not mix with operators with zero fermion number, of course. Right? It will have some conservation of fermion number. In the same way, if you have operators that have R charge that are made of complex scalars, say five units of R charge Z, it will not mix with an operator with five units of R charge X because R charge is conserved. It's a symmetry of the theory. So there are closed sectors, and you can choose particular set of operators, particular kinds of spin chain, and see what is the resulting Hamiltonian density. So let's, let me write what, the, what is the result for a few simple examples. One of them is the one relevant to study our example. Okay? So examples. One, if you consider operators made out, this was the original example that led to this idea of thinking in terms of spin chain. This was by Minahan and Zaremo in 2003. So this one was the, the, the original example that motivated this thinking in terms of this quantum spin chain way. Suppose you have some trace of just two kinds of scalars, Zs and Xs. This is one kind of words you can make. Okay, it's hard to spell, Zviak, Zviak, but uh, one kind of word. Now, this one, you could identify with a spin chain where at each degree of freedom, you either have a Z or you have an X. Okay, but if you have a spin chain with two degrees of freedom, then as physicists, it's a big temptation. Of course, we cannot resist using the notation up for Z and down for X. Just, it's just a question of notation. But it turns out it's a very nice notation because the Hamiltonian turns out to be just lambda over 2 pi square, sum from n equal 1 up to n, and then the Hamiltonian density is just you do nothing at sites n and n plus 1, or you permute sites n and n plus 1. So the permutation acts on two sides on your spin chain and gives you V A. Okay? If this guy is at position N and this one at position N plus 1. And there is something before and something after. And identity does not. And this, even though maybe it is not totally obvious, this is nothing but the so-called X, 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 Eisenberg spin chain. Okay, so it is the most famous quantum spin chain in condensed matter. So you just have spins which interact. This Hamiltonian is proportional to just a, a, a usual Hamiltonian, sigma dot with sigma at position n, n plus 1. So we see that if we know how to diagonalize quantum spin chains that appear in the study of magnets in condensed matter, we know how to study the spectrum of n equals 4 super young meals at one loop for operators made out of scalar z's and x. Okay? Another example, for example. Another one. Okay? If you consider trace of z, and then one fermion psi, out of the many that there is, you choose one. Let's call it psi one. And then z, 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 psi one, z. This is also a closed sector. This sector here is called the SU2 sector because it gives SU2 chains. This one, you also have two degrees of freedom, but one is a fermion and one is a boson. So the notation you can use, you can use, you can say that whenever you have a z, you can put, say, a zero to indicate there's nothing. And when there is a psi, you can put a psi. And then the Hamiltonian density in this case is again lambda over 2 pi square at one loop. 
lambda over 2 pi square. And then you have identity minus an operator, which I'm drawing as curly. And this guy is called a super permutator. And what it does is, if, this, if you act on vacuum, vacuum, it gives vacuum, vacuum. If it acts on vacuum fermion, it gives fermion vacuum, and similar for the other case. But if it acts on fermion fermion, it gives minus fermion fermion. So it's a statement that you have some fermionic degree of freedom. So very simple spin chain. This one turns out to be even simpler to solve because by a Jordan-Wigner transformation, you can map it to free fermions. So this one is somehow even simpler. What about the ones that we want to solve? What about operators with covariant derivatives that have spin? That's another sector. So this is called the SU1 uh, slash 1 sector. And I remind you that 1 plus 1 is 2. And this is SU2. And this is SU1 slash 1. It's more or less also like SU2. The difference is that there is a slash in the middle. So it's a super version of SU2. It's a super group. And there is another group that is also more or less SU2, which is called SU1, 1 or SL2, which is just a non-compact version of SU2. So finally, there is the so-called SL2 or SU1, 1 sector. Finally, wait, let, let, me, uh, let me remove the finally. This is just an example. Then I will mention what, what these three examples exhaust and what do they have in common. Of course, there are many other operators. The SL2 or SU1 slash 1 sector where you have operators of the form trace of some derivative in some light cone direction, uh, some number S1 of them acting on Z, okay, times some number S2 acting on Z, tac, 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 times some number SL acting on Z. And it's convenient to use a normalization where you divide each of them by S factorial. So S1 factorial, tac, 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 SL factorial. And this cat here, you think of it as a spin chain cat, which has an integer at each side, S1, S2, tac, 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 SL. Now this, you see, contains the example we have here, where here we have a spin chain with two sides, two Z fields and k derivatives in the first side, and s minus k derivatives in the second side. This is a, a kind of a, this, is, this also represents a spin chain. Now this is a non-compact spin chain. What does it mean, non-compact? means that at each side, you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, because the number of derivatives you put, s i, runs from 0, 1, 2, tac, 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 up to infinity. So it's not like at each side you can have up, down, or 0 fermion. Now you can have an, an integer, which is how many derivatives do you choose to put. OK, let me write in a minute what this Hamiltonian is, because of course this is the one that is relevant for the study of operators with spin. But let me first tell you that these are what are called the rank 1 sectors. Rank 1, rank is the, SU2 as rank 1, SU1, 1 as rank 1, and SL2 as rank 1. This is the rank of the group. Now, in general, if you consider operators in the full, okay, the general case, okay, the general case, the one in the corner there, gives not a spin chain with SU2 symmetry or with SU1 slash 1 symmetry, or with SL2 symmetry, but if you consider the general case, you get a spin chain with whose symmetry is the full symmetry of n equals 4, which is a supergroup called PSU 2, 2 slash 4, non-compact spin chain. So in general, you have some beast, some more complicated spin chain. As subsectors, as blocks of this Hamiltonian, you have these three simpler examples. Okay? Now, you see there is a slash. You can roughly think of this as SU2, 2 times SU4. Okay? 
Now, SU2, two, maybe it's not yet familiar, but SU4 probably is familiar to everyone, right? And SU4, do you know that SU4 is the same as SO6, maybe? Or if not, let me tell you. SU4 is the same as SO6. So this SU4 that we see here is nothing but the SO6 symmetry. The SU2, comma 2, the fact that you have a comma is exactly the fact that, okay, if you change a bit of signature, SO6 or this is the same. So the first factor is this one here. But then you have supersymmetry. So the symmetries is this times this times the fermionic symmetries that we rarely discuss, and here the same thing. And these symmetries, the full set of symmetries, these guys, these guys, together with the supersymmetries, form a supergroup, which is called PSU2, comma 2, slash 4. It's just a name for the group, and I'll be happy to tell you more about it tomorrow if you're interested, or today. Okay. As I said, one nice feature of the game is that these sectors factorize, and we can study each of them separately as a warm-up before attacking the full problem that we also actually know how to do, but it is just a more complicated problem. Okay. So finally, I should tell you what is the Hamiltonian for this non-compact spin chain, because it's kind of an Hamiltonian that we are not to use that we are not so used to. Okay. So in the SL2 case, The Hamiltonian, gamma, is again a sum from n equal 1 up to L of some Hamiltonian density that acts on site n and then plus 1. And this guy is the following. It acts in the following way. The Hamiltonian acting on some state which has um, k derivatives and p derivatives. So I remind you, this means that you have some trace, many fields, and then at position k, you have 1 over k factorial d to the kz multiplied by 1 over p factorial d to the pz, and then many other fields. And we consider the Hamiltonian that is acting on these two sides of the spin chain. And now what does it do to these derivatives? So these derivatives that you can think an integer, some stack of balls in each uh, side. It either does nothing, or it hops. It puts some derivative from one side to the other, or from the other one side to the next side. So the term where it does nothing, it's the following. So everything comes multiplied by lambda over 2 pi squared. The term where it does nothing gives harmonic number of k plus harmonic number of p times the cap where it does nothing, kp, okay? where harmonic numbers were defined up there. And then there is the term where they do something. So we sum over how many derivatives jump. And uh, you sum the following way. So you write here that now instead of k and p, you jump d derivatives. Okay? So d derivatives jump from the second side to the first side or from the first to the second. So this d runs from minus k, in case they jump in that direction, up to p, in case they jump from this direction. And we exclude the case where they don't jump, because this we already did. And the weight that you get, if you do the computation, is 1 over how many derivatives jump. Okay, very good. So now, so a few comments about this guy. So first of all, this Hamiltonian preserves the number of derivatives, right? So they just hops it around. 
So when diagonalizing, you can restrict to a fixed number of total derivatives, right? So you can consider operators with no derivatives, with one derivative, with two derivatives, with three derivatives, and you can do it. You can truncate the number of derivatives and consider the subspace, the Hilbert space, with a fixed number of derivatives and diagonalize it in that subspace. Okay? So the Hilbert space factorizes into the Hilbert space where the number of derivatives is equal to zero plus the Hilbert space with one derivative, Hilbert space with two derivatives, and so on. And we can diagonalize it in each sector. And then we see that there's something nice. The, the length, how big the operator is, doesn't make the problem that much more complicated conceptually. So we can, for example, now try to do this example, which has length equal to 2. But we can do now other examples with bigger length without any other words, without any extra conceptual words. So but the claim, what, is, what must be the claim if what we are saying is correct, and how can everything we discussed so far be compatible with what we have seen before. Well, what we should check is that if we take L equals to 2 okay, and define the operator S to be defined in the following form, you sum minus 1 to the K, 1 over K factorial S minus K factorial times the cat K S minus K. Notice that this binomial coefficient would give those factorials squared. But I absorb one power because the definition of the cat likes to absorb one power factor. Okay? There is some overall normalization, S factorial squared, but okay, that's irrelevant. But I can put if you want to try to trace where this is come from. So the claim is very simple. You take this operator k equals 0 up to s. And you can check that the action of this Hamiltonian on this operator OS gives lambda over 2 pi square harmonic number of s times the operator OS. It does diagonalize it. And this is the anomalous dimension. And this is nothing but gamma s computed before. Okay? Now, playing with this Hamiltonian, revisiting some of the things that you did in the homework and arriving at this result is the purpose of today's tutorial. So today's tutorial, you are exactly invited. The main point of today's tutorial is to check this. Okay? To, uh, to play a bit with this Hamiltonian and to check that indeed we get the same result. From which we can then read, if we want, the cusp anomalous dimension. Okay? So, we already simplified our life a lot. We mapped the four-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional spin chain problem. This was all, so far, about one loop. So let me end with a few comments about what happens when you go to higher loops. Well, actually not much happens. You see, at one loop, we have a nearest neighbor interaction because this is as far as the interactions can get if I only allow for one loop. If I start allowing for two loops, I can have an interaction of three sides of my spin chain. And if I allow for four loops, they can interact four sides of my spin chain. So what I will get at higher loops is the same kind of picture, except that the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian will have longer and longer range. So at higher loops, we will have that the Hamiltonian will be given by lambda times some neighbor interaction plus lambda square times an interaction that can be of range 3 plus some interaction that can be of range 4 at, uh, at 3 loops, at uh, 4 loops, plus tac, tac, tac. 1 loop, 2 loops, 3 loops, sorry. At two loops, it can be a range three. At three loops, a range four, and so on. So at one loop, we have some Hamiltonian density that takes on side n, n plus one. 
But here we can have some Hamiltonian density that knows about sign n, n plus 1, and n plus 2, and so on. So what we will get is, at the end, some long range. But OK, long range, but still, if you truncate to a given order in perturbation theory, a restricted length, long range PSU 2, 2 slash 4 non-compact spin chain. So this is the kind of problem that we will get, uh, that we will have to deal with. So what you would like is a way of giving you this Hamiltonian densities without too much work. And then you, should, you only have to diagonalize this long-range spin chain. And the notion of closed sectors, the closed sectors I, I wrote, they exist at any loop order. So actually, you can consider a generalization of the Heisenberg spin chain, for example, that instead of just interaction between neighboring spins, also interact now three spins. And you have some interaction, which is something like sigma cross sigma dot sigma, and stuff like this, which starts involving now three spins. And similarly with derivatives and so on. <laughs> but notice, that's an important point, that this is a huge simplification. We went from a four-dimensional gauge theory problem to a problem in the domain of 1D quantum spin chains. But let me remind you that the Hilbert space is exponentially large. So even if you are just dealing with Heisenberg spin chain, you have a 2 to the L Hilbert space. So as soon as you consider operators made out of, say, six fields, it's already, it starts already to be quite tough, even with a computer to diagonalize. Right? So we simplified our problem dramatically. No more Feynman diagrams. Now we study spin chains. But it's not like it's a, a rose garden. I mean, it's still an exponentially big Hilbert space. So it's still kind of a challenge to see how could this approach, first of all, we start in perturbation theory. Then it's exponentially hard. How can we start hoping to not only compute weak coupling, but even at some curve that goes all the way from weak to strong coupling? So clearly, we still need some technique which is even more powerful than what we have done. Otherwise, it's hard to imagine that we will be able to do things as remarkable as to do a plot all the way from weak to strong coupling. OK? But OK, that we will have to postpone a bit. That we will start seeing what kind of techniques are those after tomorrow, and what we will do tomorrow is go to the bolt, go to the inside, to the interior of this cylinder, and look for spinning strings. Look for strings that are rotating inside, compute their energy, okay? And, for example, check that when the spin is large that it does go logarithmically with the spin, for example, as a check already of some, some features of ADS-CFT. If ADS-CFT is correct, the, the energy of this operator should go logarithmically with the spin. Okay, so two things about uh, tomorrow. One thing, I decided that it's possible to do just Nambugoto, and since you didn't have Polyakov, I will adapt and I will do everything in Nambugoto, so you don't need to worry about, uh, about that. But I urge you to have a look at the computation that you did for the rotating string in flat space, because we will now do the same computation where the string is not rotating in flat space, but it's rotating inside the box. Okay, so it's useful that if you remind it that there was some energy dependence and the energy went like square root of the spin. Remember, this was the Regi trajectory. Okay, so energy square goes like the spin. For example, that's some result that we should reproduce if the string is very small, because if the string is in the middle of the box, it doesn't feel this gravitational potential, we should reproduce that result. But if the string is very large, we should start seeing the effects of the gravitational box, and that's where the log S will kick in. So please remind yourselves of that computation, because tomorrow we are going to generalize it and see it in, in action in ADS. Okay, I think we are done with the CFT for now.